being displayed. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag in the United States of America and to the Republic, which is stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Staff, will you please do a roll call, please? Yes, good morning. This is Danielle. This is Danielle from Hart. Can you hear me? I can. Awesome. Um, <laughs> Director Melanie Williams, please say here yeah. when I call your name. Here. Thank you. Director David Mechanic. Director David Mechanic, are, are you here? Director David Mechanic. Commissioner Pat Kemp. Commissioner Pat Kemp. Director Rich, Richard McLean. Here. Commissioner Kimberly Overman. Here. Councilman Gil Schisler. Here. Chair Williams, you have a quorum. Director Williams, are you there? Yes. Heart General Counsel Julia Mandel will read into the record rules for committee participation. I'll hand it over to you, Julia, now. Uh, great. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, as you know, we're having a, an unusual meeting given the circumstances. So the rules of this, uh, I'm going to read out the rules for this meeting. The board welcomes public comments about any issues and concerns and has made provisions to allow for virtual public comment. Public comments offered virtually will be afforded equal consideration as if they were offered in person. Anyone wanting to provide public comment for Ms. any Mandel, part of the committee? Yes. We were looking for the rules for committee participation, not the public comment. Very good. I will go ahead and read those as well. Um, Thank you so much. I thought we were at the public comment side. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, all right. These are the rules for uh, committee participation. Thank you for your participation in this virtual meeting. The change of meeting location from in-person at Hart Administrative Offices to virtual meeting is pursuant to Executive Order Number 20-69 issued by the State of Governor of the State of Florida on March 20, 2020, and Section 120.54 Florida Statutes. 
Due to social distancing, the boardroom in the e-board administrative offices is only accessible for personnel facilitating the meeting. Please keep your devices and phones muted while you are not speaking. Muting the sound and the microphone on your devices, it helps to avoid feedback. Please do not enable the video camera, a video or camera on your device and discontinue all personal conversations during the meeting. Please follow along with a copy of the meeting agenda and materials sent via email. All presentation will be shared on the screen while presented. Roll call will be taken for attendance and voting by heart staff, which we have already done. Quotum and voting results will be announced. Please wait to announce your attendance until your name is called during roll call. There will be an opportunity for members of the public who have pre-registered with heart staff to provide comments. General counsel will read into the record the public comment participation rules. During the meeting, please wait until the chair asks for comments or questions from the committee board member for each agenda item as the meeting progresses. When you want to provide a comment or ask a question, please use the hand signal button, is, which is the white circle next to your name on the screen. The hand will turn blue when activated. Oh, really? So you can join links. You're also going to call in. Okay. Give me that call in. Okay. So if you, um, hold on, I gotta get out of this screen. Commissioner mm -hmm. Kemp, I believe that you joined the meeting. Could you please mute your computer? Mute your. They were asking that you mute your computer. Mm -hmm. Okay. So sorry, your I, I, do you have yourself? Is that doing? Julia, would you mind proceeding with the instructions, please, and the guidelines? I sure will. I'm going to uh, go back to the middle about the um, comments. When you want to provide a comment or ask a question, please signal that you want to speak by activating the, the hand button. Needs to be muted. Okay, I believe it yeah, is. Yeah. Yes. Okay. You there? Raquel? Commissioner Kemp, we Should can I go ahead? Commissioner Kemp, is that you? It looks as though she has muted her device again. Uh, this is Julia Manda. I'll go ahead and proceed while we're uh, waiting on those parts of the technical aspects. Um, the hand button will turn blue when activated. Staff will read the hands raised in order for the chair to acknowledge. The participant may unmute their device and speak. Please speak your name before your comment. That's actually really important because remember, we need to keep a, a, a record of this uh, for the purposes of assuring that we have complied with the rules of the executive order. So it's really important that everybody speaks their name before they speak. Presenters, Please note that all presentations will be controlled by HART staff. Ensure you state your name, title, company, organization for the record. Please say next slide when needed, and staff will progress through the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. Next, uh, the agenda item is, approved, is the approval of operations and safety committee meeting minutes from February 17, 2020. You can find the minutes on page six of the packet. Is there a motion to approve the minutes? This is Commissioner Overman. I move approval, please, of the minutes. Thank you. And Council do we have a Schussler, second? Uh, Councilman Schussler, second. Thank you. Staff will take the, bo the vote by name. Thank you. This is Danielle again from Hart. The motion, to, the motion was to approve the minutes from the February 17th, 2020 committee meeting. It was made by Commissioner Overman, seconded by Council Member Schisler. Melanie Williams, or please state yay or nay after I call your name. Melanie Williams? Yay. D Director Mechanic? 
Director Mechanic. Commissioner Pat Kemp. Rich McLean. Yay. Commissioner Overman. Yay. Councilman Schisler. Yay. The motion passes four to two. Well, I'm sorry. There were just two that abstained. Uh, I'm sorry. This is Julia Mandel, and I kind of do need to, to comment on this because you know, these are very special times and circumstances. If, if we have Mr. Mechanic and Ms. Kemp, uh, commissioners on the phone, they have to either take an action of yay or nay, other, or if they're not a, a part of the a, a not sitting at the virtual dais, then they're just considered non-voting because you're obligated to vote on every item that comes before you if you're sitting there. So I say that if Commissioner if Board Member Mechanic and Commissioner Kemp are on the line, we need to see if they are able to take an action. Otherwise, they will be considered not at the that have left the meeting for this part of the vote. Commissioner Kemp, are you on the line? Uh, Ms. Mandel, is it possible to receive the vote via email? No, you can't receive the vote via email. If, if they're not on the line as the vote takes place, it's not a vote of no. It's a vote of uh, they are not in attendance for the vote. Okay, understood. It, it needs to be noted that way in the minutes. Hey, Danielle, do we have control of the, to, the mute and unmute? Do we have a way to unmute to, to see if Commissioner Kemp can hear us from that standpoint? We have unmuted everybody. Okay. Thank you, Danielle. Uh, we just heard from Raquel's aide, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, from <laughs> Commissioner Kemp's aide that they are, she's still not telephonically in the meeting because they're still working on it. They're having technical issues. So can she be counted as not, is that not attending? She's not in, she's not in attendance at the meeting at this time. The motion, we'll need to know when she, she okay. comes on to the, the call and the time of that. Yes, ma'am. The motion still passes with a vote of four to zero then. Thank you. The next agenda item in public is public comment. Hart General Counsel Julia Mandel will read into record the rules for public participation. Uh, yes, I'll go ahead and read the rules for public participation. The board welcomes public comments about any issues and concerns and has made provisions to allow for virtual public comment. Public comments offered virtually will be afforded equal consideration as if they were offered in person. Anyone wanting to provide public comment for any heart committee or board meeting should contact Danielle Arthur, board administrator at Arthur, A-R-T-H-U-R-D at gohart, G-O-H-A-R-T dot org dot O-R-G or at 813-955-2426 with your name, phone number, for pre-registration. Comments are due by 5 p.m. the day previous to the meeting. Staff will call on speakers by name in the order in which the registrations are received. All callers will be muted upon calling and unmuted in the submission order after being recognized by name. Please state your full name, organization, or address if desired, up to three minutes are allowed for each speaker, and the speaker will be muted once their time is up. Staff, please proceed. If there's any public comments. Thank you, Julia. Are there any public comments at this time? There was public comment from one person. Dexter, can you go ahead and merge those calls, please? Dexter from Hart, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. 
The public has joined the call. Good morning, committee members. This is Yolanda Jennings from HART. This morning we have one public comment. At this time, Karen Kress will be joining the meeting. Ms. Kress, you may now start your public comment. As a reminder, you have three minutes. Uh, good morning. Am I being heard okay? The public has joined the call. Good morning, committee members. This is Yolanda Jennings from HART. This morning we have one public comment. At this time, Karen Kress will be joining the meeting. Ms. Kress, you may now start your public comment. As a reminder, you have three minutes. Good, good morning, HART board members. Can you hear me okay? Uh, good morning. Yes. Am I being heard okay? Yes, good morning. We can hear you. Karen, okay. you need to this turn off Karen. your um, computer or, or minimize the video in your background because it's, it's delayed and actually interrupting your speech. Okay, this is Karen Kress with the Tampa Downtown Partnership. I appreciate you making accommodations for me. I'm calling about item 4C on your agenda. Um, it's a request for Hart to continue to serve as the fiscal agent for the current downtown circulation service that we have plans for through the end of September of 2020. I want to note that this action does not require any additional Hart funding. Uh, through a collaborative process, we were able to, um, the Florida Department of Transportation and the City of Tampa have both stepped up to the plate to split the cost of the service. What that allows us to do is preserve heart funds to be used once a long-term solution is put into place in the coming fiscal year. Um, you have the commitment of the Tampa Downtown Partnership to continue to work with HART, the Florida Department of Transportation, the City of Tampa, and a couple private sector funders uh, on a long-term solution for downtown circulation. So again, asking for HART to just continue to serve as a fiscal agent for a variety of more technical reasons. Um, to give us this six month kind of pause process to keep some kind of circulation service in place while HART staff works to come up with a better long term vision. Thank you again. Thank you, Karen. Committee members, this concludes the public comments. Thank you. We will move to our, our next committee, uh, our com committee action item. Mr. Bracken, you Thanks are for using recognized. WebEx. Visit our website at www.webex.com. Mr. Bracken, you are recognized. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, good morning, uh, Madam Chair and uh, com uh, committee members. Um, before you is the uh, committee action item to authorize the Interim Chief Executive Officer to award a contract to West Coast Transportation Incorporated for transportation services in the amount uh, to be $3,600,000 and based on the current utilization averages of one year with a two-year option on this program. Um, we started this program back in 2016. It's been a very popular program and we have delivered to date over 292,000 trips. Um, and that is same-day service that is not offered under the regular Heart Plus program. Uh, Yellow Cab and United were our original awardees last contract. United is no longer bidding, so we had uh, West Coast is the, the uh, winning bidder on our RFP process that went out um, a couple months ago. Um, due to some delays in the board action items, um, we did have to do a three-month extension um, with the current contract in order to wait till we got this back to our uh, committee and the board for approval. Um, there has not been a price increase since we started in 2016. Uh, they did come in with a, a, an increase this time. Um, we did negotiate it down um, and it comes up to a dollar uh, per trip increase for the first year and an additional 60 cents on the second and third uh, subsequent years. Um, Overall, this program has saved us over almost $3 million so far. Um, 27 was in the, when we wrote this original board packet, uh, but as of the writing of this, we're at almost $3,510,000 that we have saved. It 
compared to if we had ran it in-house ourselves. So it's been a very popular program, and we're looking for your uh, authorization to move this forward. Thank you, Mr. Brecken. And are there any comments or questions by the committee members for staff? Yes, thank you. Uh, my only question was, it was, was the, the comparison done internally or was this, a, was this an external uh, recalculation to make sure that we're actually not costing us more to do it this way? And that's probably a question for Ms. Stiglitz. Sir, I don't know that she's on the call, but I can, uh, what we're using for comparison is each month we have a what it costs us to do a paratransit trip um, in-house rate, and we're utilizing that rate to do the comparison of the trips that we performed, um, that they performed compared to what if we had done it ourselves. So we're using our actual our, monthly rate. What, what is our rate right now? Uh, we're at $28 a trip right now. In house. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. Are there any more com uh, comments or questions? This is this is Ms. I did, but it was basically the same question. This is Commissioner Overman. I move to approval. This is. Councilman Shusser, I Okay, we have an, uh, on a motion to approve, and we also have a motion to second. Danielle, do you have those names counted, documented? Yes, ma'am. The motion was to approve committee action item 4A. It was made by Commissioner Overman, seconded by Council Member Schistler. Please say yay or nay after I call your name. Director Melanie Williams. Yay. Director David Mechanic. Yay. Commissioner Pat Kemp. Yay. Director Richard McLean. Yay. Commissioner Kimberly <laughs> Overman. Yay. Councilmember Gil Schisler. Yay. Motion passes with a vote of six to zero. Thank you, Danielle. We are now going to move to our action item uh, with Mr. Cro Cochran. You are recognized to make a pre presentation in the support of this action. to BEEP Incorporated, an automated mobility service for a period of one year with one year with an additional one year option for a not to exceed amount of $914,928.38. Um, this project is to provide an autonomous mobility service along the Marion Transit uh, Way as a demonstration not only um, how we can move people with automated vehicles, but also to learn about the public's attitudes towards automation um, and to document the safety benefits of, of, such, a, uh, of such a service um, and bring um, um, highly automated vehicles forward uh, within the connected vehicle environment that exists downtown that um, Hart uh, participates in as well. So this is kind of a multi-tiered um, project. Next slide, please. I'll give you an overview here of the RFP schedule, um, as well as the budget here in the, um, in the coming slides. The RFP was, was originally issued um, on January 8th. 
The deadline for submissions was um, February 14th, and the project evaluation was completed um, on March 20th of this year, all of them uh, this year, um, with a, a, uh, um, a four-member team, two from Hart, one from the City of Tampa, and one member from the Florida Department of Transportation. Um, all of those, the uh, critical stakeholders um, in, this, uh, in this project. Next slide, please. The schedule for the key deliverables here, um, upon notice of uh, to proceed, uh, if chosen uh, to proceed after the May board, um, the first business day afterwards, we would have a project kick up, kickoff. Um, the projected shuttle delivery and off-site testing would begin 45 days after that notice to proceed. So we would expect the shuttle to be delivered down into the Tampa area and um, have some testing beginning. Um, on-site field testing would begin without passengers uh, 10 days later um, on about the 55th day. Um, uh, after the notice pr to proceed and our um, official pilot launch date, the, the um, projected start date would be 61 business days after the notice to proceed. So we're looking at um, a two month period between the notice to proceed and having an operation on the Marion Transit Way for this program. Next slide, please. To give you an idea of the budget here, this project is 100% funded by DOT. Uh, there is no heart funding um, that is uh, required for this. Um, the current um, funding from DOT is uh, $915,000. Um, in the original proposal from BEEP, um, the first year base was um, uh, just shy of uh, five and a half, um, um, 500 and fifty thousand dollars and they proposed um uh, an optional for two for years two and three that exceeded the budget we were able to negotiate a final price with only one year option and we feel very confident that that is plenty of time um to be able to gather the amount of data necessary to meet the goals and purpose of this program um, and as you can see, the, uh, the base year um, would maintain the same as the original proposal, and the option actually came down a little bit um, from the original year two um, proposal. So uh, we feel strongly we, we had a, uh, a good negotiation here, and this will be a, um, a strong project moving forward. Next slide, please. So uh, ultimately, our, our action item that we're asking you to um, uh, approve here is the recommendation to authorize the interim chief executive officer to award a contract to Beep Incorporated and automated mobility service for a period of one year with one year option for a not to exceed amount of $914,928.38 to move uh, forward to the May board meeting. I'll take any questions. This is Director McLean, motion to approve. Do a motion to second? Commissioner Omar, your, your knowledge. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just have a quick question. I recognize this is paid for, you know, by, by FDOT. We've been working on this for a bit. But I'm, I'm concerned that if we start this project while we're in this emergency situation, the validity of the ridership and attitudes may be different if we had a robust downtown transit ridership and foot traffic. Um, when would the actual, um, what do we call it, demonstration begin? And do we, these are two questions, when would it begin? And then two, have we measured traffic and foot traffic downtown to determine whether or not a study like this would be of value given that it only starts for a year? And I'll, I'll close there. So the, the proposal is we, we can certainly, um, the, the consultant or, or the vendor rather can come in and get everything set up um, for the first 60 days and be prepared to launch um, 
um, as their proposed schedule for the, um, it would be 61 days to the day of the notice to proceed. So presumably January, uh, excuse me, July 5th, that would be. So if we approved it, um, May 4th, I believe is the board meeting. So that would be July 5th is their proposed day to, to start. Um, that, however, um, we understand we are in, um, we are in different times right now, and we would um, certainly make um, some adjustments to this schedule if we had to. Um, the critical goal of this is to be able to measure um, um, public attitudes and, and the social impact and safety of this. And if, if we're not able to obtain that um, at this period of time, um, we, will, we will ensure that, that we, we work with the vendor to adjust the time schedule um, to be able to, to make that happen. Um, and um, I'm sorry, can you repeat your second question so I make sure I, I, I answer it exactly what you're looking for? Yes, um, based on the foot traffic and transit traffic that we have downtown yeah. currently, if that does not return, for example, if we have a stay at home order in place for several several months and then people are still encouraged to work from home to reduce the spread, um, you know, would, would there be a, a validity in their reports and results? Well, I think um, from the standpoint of measuring statistic validity of any project we're able to take into account um, situations are, that are occurring. We have a baseline of existing um, uh, ridership downtown. Um, we have years and years of data of ridership in the downtown area. We can um, use historical data of how people are moving in the downtown area. And I feel very confident that we would be able to um, use that historical data to, to adjust any, um, any measurements necessary. Um, and, um, you know, I, I, I think, I think your, your point is uh, very well taken and, and we, need to, we need to take that into um, uh, consideration um, uh, very seriously and, and we will. And I, I, I hope that answers your question. Chris, thank this you is very Jake much. Mechanic. Thank, this thank is you Jake very Mechanic. much for your answer. Can I, I? Okay, I just have this a follow up to Chris. Yes, Chris. It's based on your answer. So, would it be a benchmark to determine when the actual demonstration would begin? Is when our downtown ridership actually returns to that historical benchmark? And then I'll close there. Um, I, you know, I, I, <clears throat> that's a, um, that is a good question. And uh, I think if we were to, if businesses and um, the economy was to open up downtown and we were able to get ridership moving again in the downtown area and we saw growth moving back towards um, what it is that it that it was previously um, I don't see any reason why we wouldn't be able to get valid numbers out of uh, out of this project um, I you know I think it we nobody knows if um, if what the impact is going to be on the baseline across the entire system. So, um, you know, if if foot traffic comes back to downtown um, after um, after any limitations are lifted, um, you know, this is this this is just another uh, option downtown for people to move from Marion Transit Center to the downtown area um, and we can and we can measure it appropriately regardless. You'll show some of the question. You are recognized, Director Fletcher. Thank you. Um, Chris, nice good presentation. I just have a couple of questions. 
Um, given, again, uh, piggybacking off of uh, Commissioner Oberman's concerns, given the current status of uh, uh, finances throughout the state, I know it's not costing us anything, but will this contract be written in such a way that uh, prevents um, this company from coming back to from, from coming back to heart, just in case F dot, you know, they're 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 working off the of state funds, they're working off the of sales tax revenues, uh, ir- irrespective of whether they're already committed or not. Um, revenues are way down, and I fully expect the state to start uh, modifying their budgeted. Uh, uh, Responses to uh, what they what they said they were going to do. In that case, will Hart be on the would be on the hook for this if say F dot decides that well now we're we're not really excited about doing this anymore and uh, we don't have a million dollars to throw at this I, at this point because we're going to have we're going to have financial constraints too in in, in the coming year slash years. Uh, what it Will this contract be written in such a way to prevent them from, you know, looking to heart in order to satisfy this obligation? So, uh, so that's a good question, um, uh, Director. These funding, the, the, these funds were uh, committed to heart actually back in in 2017. So this money is um, already committed to heart for this project. We have a a signed agreement with um, with DOT for this funding. We actually have the funding in hand to be able to do this project. So um, I really, um, and unless um, uh, Ms. Stiglitz has, um, um, wants to correct me, I, I, I don't see how um, we cannot get our fund, how we would lose our funding from DOT. Um, this money was budgeted um, three years ago, and and we've had it. We've just we've run into a couple roadblocks with some um, with some vendors previously um, that we certainly don't anticipate happening happening um, with with this um, vendor who is uh, much more experienced than the others. So, well, do we have this money in our accounts? I mean, or 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 what's the process for that? Because the state of Florida, if they run out of cash, I think they can. Which is happening with no sales tax revenue, we could have a problem for ourselves. I've seen it happen in other areas. Um, I know you can't answer that, but it's okay, good. I, I hear that Cindy's on the line. I'm going to let yes. her answer this. Yes, good morning. For the record, Cindy Stiglitz, interim CFO for Hart. Um, I did have a conversation with um, FDOT on Friday, not specifically about this item but in general about the anticipated impact um, that the um, this, this current state of affairs will have on future funding, including um, our one of our biggest sources of revenue from them, which is the block grant. Um, at this point, they do not anticipate that that will affect us, um, at least not in the upcoming fiscal year. Um, and certainly, as Chris said, this particular grant was allocated about three years ago. Um, we we do need to get this funding extended. We are working on an extension because most of their service development grants are for a period of three to- three years. Um, and as you know, we've uh, you know struggled to to get this project underway. Um, it, it was my impression in that conversation on Friday that this funding will not be affected. Thank okay, you. Thank are there you. any other questions? Commissioner Kemp, you are, you are recognized. Thank you. Um, I have some uh, questions. So I understand that the, the first year is in there, and the one-year option, that is also uh, DOT totally would, if, if there was a second uh, one-year option, it would be DOT's money. So the, the total amount of the funding that is left, um, this was a $1 million um, agreement. Uh, the the amount that is left is about nine hundred and fifteen thousand uh, dollars. So the contract before you is a one year option with a one or a one year 
term with a one-year renewal option not to exceed the 914000 just right under that $915,000 threshold. So, yes, this would be um, completely funded by FDOT. Okay, even the second year. Um, here's my other, um, and I'll just uh, say with this concern, uh, I think probably a lot of the board isn't very familiar with this project since it was really heavily discussed before many uh, people were um, members of the board that are members now. Um, and in, in the first contract fell through. So, as I understand, First Coach, Coach has, you know, I think I've been in their vehicles, which are little person theaters, um, and they will have a person on board that. Is that true, um, Chris? Uh, yes, Commissioner. This, this, will, there absolutely will be uh, somebody, um, a a uh, person on board that can take over um, uh, manual operation at any given time. Um, that is a requirement, um, uh, not only by law, but of this. Uh, 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 more importantly, of this contract. Um, and I think we would have, we certainly would have done that regardless of the law. Um, and that's part of that is. Um, you know, the, the the amount of ridership that we get out of this project is isn't the is not even necessarily the primary goal of this pilot. Um, a lot of it is to learn about the public's attitudes towards automation. Are they willing to um, accept it? Um, um, we will be doing surveys and getting the understanding of would people be comfortable if we in if in the future um automation did lead to uh people they're not being an attendant on board um and um of course documenting the safety benefits is probably the most important um aspect of this um so um, um that's that's really really the goal uh, of this but yes this, ma'am th there will be people on board six, is this a six person vehicle uh, no, this one will hold, uh, I, I believe, up to eight, eight, eight people it can hold. Okay. Okay, so it's like a um, small van. Here's my, here's my concern at this point, very, very clear. Um, the, it looks like social distancing, from all I can tell, will be part of what we need to do um, till there's a vaccine. And I'm wondering about putting a small um, vehicle in operation at this time about the cleaning regime and about, um, you know, all, um, you know, about how we, I mean, it seems to me we'd have to only have, like, if it was eight persons, we'd have to have a maximum of four people maybe uh, besides the person that has to be in there. I'm just wondering if you could comment on that with regards to kind of the new situation that we find ourselves in. Well, I think you bring up a very good point, and um, I, you know, I think that's a discussion that we, um, moving forward, before we deploy um, and operate uh, the operation, that is something that we need to work very closely with um, um, Mr. Malloy and, and uh, safety and um, uh, Miss uh, uh, Miss House Stewart to to determine um, what is the best way to protect our customers. Um, while at the same time being able to deploy the pilot, so and and uh, we 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 absolutely will have that discussion, um, and and to go back to the original point that Commissioner Overman brought up, um, we need to be mindful of when is it appropriate to launch this in consideration of everything that's going on. We certainly don't want to deploy it too early, um, um, in understanding the new environment that we're in. Yeah, I would just say <clears throat> at this time, it really just doesn't seem like the time to be doing this and with the uh, questions and considerations. That's, that's all. I understand. Thank you. Danielle, Ms. Ms. House Stewart would like to speak. I just wanted to speak to say that I do think that we need to move on this because not to um, contradict none of the valid comments that were raised, but this is the third attempt by heart to move this award into a real uh, vehicle. Uh, as you know, the first contract, we had a contract dispute. It was a dismal failure. 
uh, the second one as we got into examining the capabilities of the um, proposed vendor, a wise decision was made not to move forward. And I had a long conversation with DOT in December regarding Hart's commitment to this project, regarding Chris's commitment with the vendor uh, that whomever would be selected. So we're asking the uh, committee to please uh, let this move forward at this time. And we will take into consideration the fluidity of the situation regarding COVID and any executive orders that might be in place. But I don't think there's anything now that prevents us from moving forward to allow the contract to go forward and the um, select vendor to start doing what they need to do within the parameters of what they can to get this vehicle uh, built. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other? Yes. Okay, Director Mechanic, you all recognize. Director Mechanic. No, I didn't. I can't get my hand down. Sorry. <laughs> this is Director McClain. Sorry, Director McClain, go for it, please. Yeah, I'm, I apologize. My hand is raised, but um, for some reason it's not coming through. Um, I, I just want to second um, with what Ms. Um, Hal Stewart mentioned there in terms of moving forward. Um, I, I too recognize we're in a <clears throat> difficult environment right now in terms of of AVs and and, and what I would call mass transit. Um, however, I do believe um, that we need to continue down the road um, with the hopes that we'll come out of this sooner than later. Um, all the all the comments made uh, were were spot on in my regards. Um, they're all valid. They're all uh, concerns that I too have. But to push this off either another six months to another year, uh, to me, I think is is a little reckless. In that we stand to lose funding first if we really want to do these type of projects, and then also we we continue to push what I would call advancement down the road. Um, again understand we are in difficult times right now, uh, a little bit of confusion on what's the road forward. However, I don't think we ought to stop projects moving forward. We just got to recognize that there are some caveats we need to build into them uh, in regards to timing slips, in regards to changes of environment. Uh, and I think we can do that in a, in a very prudent method and, and manner going forward um, without having to what I would call stop programs in their tracks. So um, my comments, my motion still stands on the table there um, for approval and moving forward um, in regards to uh, this op opportunity. Thank you. Are there any other comments? Yes, ma'am, thank you. Um, I just wanted to um, volunteer that um, and as I mentioned before, there is an extension on the table with FDOT. Um, having an executed contract um, is a criteria for them to extend beyond June 30th. Yeah. So okay. even if we were to modify the implementation of the program going forward, uh, in order for them to renew or extend that million dollars or that $915,000, we have to have an executed contract to demonstrate um, our investment in the program. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Dr. Director McLean has already motioned. Do we have a second? You'll show for second. Thank you. Danielle, will you take a vote, please? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. The, no. 
I apologize that. Yes, ma'am. The motion is to approve committee action item 4B. It was made by Director McLean and seconded by Councilman Schisler. Please say yay or nay after I call your name. Director Melanie Williams. Yay. Director David Mechanic. Yes. Commissioner Pat Kemp. Commissioner Pat Kemp? Yes. Director Richard McLean? Yes. Commissioner Kimberly Overman? Yes. Councilmember Gil Schisler? Yes. The motion passes with a vote of six to zero. Thank you. Thank you, Danielle. Uh, Mr. Cochran, you uh, will stay off because you are also going to make the next rep presentation. Uh, yes, ma'am. Thank you. Board seat, please. Thank you. Thank you. The next item is uh, is to an action item authorizing, asking for the authorization of the interim chief executive officer to ex execute a memorandum of understanding between Hillsborough Transit Authority and Tampa Downtown Partnership to assist with operating the Tampa Downtown on-demand transportation service from April 1 through September 30th, 2020 in a not to exceed amount of $186,000. <clears> so, uh, for those of you who uh, were here in August, um, and for those of you who were not in, in uh, the August board, we um, authorized, uh, you all authorized a contract, um, essentially an extension with the uh, down, downtown partnership for an amount of $568,000, not to exceed um, for the extension of the um, uh, downtowner operation service in downtown uh, that would carry through March 30th of this year. Um, and we are now at the end of that contract. The expectation here was to develop a transition plan by way of a new RFP solution that would implement a long-term plan um, that not only um, meets the needs of um, looking at how we can continue this innovation and on-demand uh, downtown service, um, which allows us to take advantage of uh, some additional um, significant DOT funding in the long term, but also satisfy the um, requirements that you have, you of the board um, have set forth um, between us, uh, excuse me, for us. So at this point in time, uh, what we are asking for, this particular action item is to extend the, the, a final agreement from uh, retroactively from April 1st through September 30th. Um, and this is um, uh, a, a way for us to get the RFP on the street and get it implemented um, in, in our schedule by October 1st, which would be our, our first day of our new fiscal year. Next slide, please. So the FD, FDOT has um, identified an additional $90,000 for the uh, downtowner to assist in carrying the program through September 30th, 2020. And the Tampa CRA board also uh, authorized to cover the local match for this remaining six months of additional service through 2020, um, which was approved on by city council on March uh, 12th of this year, uh, with the expectation that we would um, that they would look at piloting some fare for point-to-point -point service, as well as potentially um, piloting some type of fixed route pilot ideas um, that would uh, give an idea um, of, of what we potentially could do in the long term as well. And that's something, something that we are um, working on uh, implementing into the RFP as well. Um, 
And um, I do want, I, what's very important here is to note is at the direction of the board, it was very important that you were not, you all were not comfortable um, in heart putting up any money for this project. And we've worked very hard in working with our partners at the city and Tampa Downtown Partnership and DOT and coming up a, in a way that we can do this at no additional cost to heart. And I will go over how we were able to achieve that here in a moment. Uh, next slide, please. So how we would implement this remaining six months, um, there, there are some proposed enhancement services during the six month period. And that would include um, the downtowner implementing some additional virtual hubs, um, which they've been very good at, at um, doing already and, and creating um, additional, um, additional shared routes, uh, uh, shared services. And they, they've um, really done well in increasing the amount of shared trips. Obviously right now during, um, during this period of time, they are not allowing shared trips. Uh, but when we are through this, hopefully uh, soon, we will be, they will be able to get back to doing that. Um, and then the, another proposed enhanced services is looking at the potential for some type of fixed route uh, based um, service based on historical ridership demand. So if they can identify that people are traveling from one area to the other, can they do some vehicle resource allocation to create some sort of potential on-demand flex fixed route uh, type services that, um, um, that they can look at, at, at doing? Um, and we would look at at um, the potential of doing that within the six month period, if it's feasible, if time um, allows for that. Um, another important um, thing in here that we're definitely looking at, at introducing is fares. And that's helping us to understand how we can better, um, um, to better uh, pay for this service in the long run and see what kind of impact that that has on um, um, introducing the fare would, um, help decrease the demand um, of, uh, of service and, and reducing the amount of wait time for people. Um, and um, that will be a, a part of, of what we look at in developing our long-term program as well. So I think what's another important point here is that this working group has been established to develop this long range solution, which will ultimately be represented in RFP, which is, um, um, about to be wrapped up here very quickly. Um, we've been working very closely with the city, DOT, and strategic property partners in downtown um, to establish the best uh, way forward to uh, meet the expectations of both the board and DOT and how they are willing to accept the funding um, for, um, for this service in the future. <clears throat> Next slide, please. So for this six month contract, just to give you the financial summary of how this is all broken down, of that $568,000 from the contract that was approved in August, Hart currently has $96,000 left over um, as of, uh, as of uh, April 1st. And that would be added to, um, now that, that money um, essentially belongs to DOT to this program. It is money that cannot be trans, uh, transferred. Um, if, it, if it is to be spent on this, it has to remain with heart um, and spent on this. It would be added to DOT's additional 90,000 that they've found to, um, to, that they have um, um, introduced to put up for this program. And then again, the CRA is it has uh, committed um, by a city council vote to provide 100% of the match, um, which is a 50-50 match um, um, for, for the remainder of this contract from April 1 through the end of September. So the total amount of funding would be 372,000 um, <clears throat> and the amount that, um, the amount Minus the CRA's match would be 186,000. That is what we are asking for in the uh, in the proposed action item. <clears throat> Next slide, please. So, the the final uh, um, action item that we're asking for you to take to the board is to authorize the interim chief executive officer to execute the memora memorandum of understanding between Hillsborough Transit Authority and Tampa Downtown Partnership to assist with operating the Tampa Downtown on-demand transportation service um, 
from April 1st, 2020 through September 30th, 2020 in a not to exceed amount of $186,000. Um, and as you can see, uh, just due to the situation that we have going on, this obviously is retroactive back to uh, April 1st. So take any questions that you, you have. Thanks, Chris. The floor is open for questions. Anyone have questions? Commissioner Kip, you are recognized. Thank you. Right. Um, um, as you know, I've been a, a critic of this on-demand um, concierge service that's been being offered because we haven't had a downtown fixed-route bus, which would be available at a much lower cost. Um, so I am interested in seeing that moving forward. I'm very disappointed that we haven't started that already, but the RFP... Um, that you speak about for the future. What Are you talking about something that would um, take place after September when you refer to that, or are you talking about this MOU? No, uh, uh, Commissioner, the RFP um, would be put out on the street here uh, very soon. Uh, we are, it is going through um, the different departments um, to, to make sure that everything is um, good with it, and um, that would begin um, that the service that's being proposed in the RFP would begin October 1st, so there is no lapse between um, this service um, for the extension of the contract and what we are proposing to take over in October 1st. And I will tell you... Okay. Um, I, go ahead, I'm sorry. Excuse me, this is uh, Carolyn Stewart. Um, Commissioner, we've asked Chris to focus on just the MOU today, and we will be coming back with you later at another uh, committee meeting regarding the proposal he's talking about for the well, service. Well, I that understand is not that. Prepared yet. I, I understand that, but I do have questions. The RFP, I believe, should be going to the um, Strategic Planning Committee to be looking at that because that is strategic planning. So I just want to point that out. Um, and we should be part of that on the Strategic Planning Committee and on the board. And that's very important because that's policy and that's what we're doing moving forward. So I think it's just, I just want to make that point about what our future with CART is. And again, just in terms of this, across the country, Uber and Lyft and on demand type services are um, doing far more poorly than. Uh, transit is, again, because people with distancing and, and, and uncertainty in um, getting in these Uber Lyft type of vehicles. And, and again, I'll just say that there's um, no place in the country where they're having on-demand downtown service because it's not the type of thing that um, is, is uh, the most efficient use of funding. So uh, in the future, especially because we're hitting on these very, very hard times. Um, I think we need to be looking at that RFP on the Strategic Planning Committee before it goes out. I want to make that really clear um, and have further discussion about this at the Strategic Planning Committee before it goes out for what we're looking at for September. Are there any other questions in regards to this action item? Yes, thank, thank you. you. Um, I'm uh, Chris. Good presentation. I'm a little confused, though. Um, I, I thought Ms. Chris said that we were going to be uh, basically the, uh, uh, the the fiscal conduit, and it wasn't going to cost us anything additional because they had secured the funds from the, the city and, and so forth. That 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 doesn't include the, the ninety six thousand. Or, I mean, are we truly just a fiscal agent, or is this, are we actually paying money into this? Uh, no, sir, we are, not paying, we are not paying any money into this. Um, um, we are simply, the reason why we are, we are kind of the, the, 
the pass through, if you will, is because that $96,000 cannot be transferred to any other agency um, just by the nature of how that funding um, exists from DOT. Um, therefore, um, it has to come through us um, and um, and, and that's essentially how it works. So we will, we will be doing the invoicing is all is all set up and done by the Tampa Downtown Partnership and, and given to us, and um, we essentially submit it to DOT. That it's kind, kind of as simple as that. Uh, there's Cindy might be able to give you a little more detail on it if you want to get into the nitty gritty of of more of it. But that's essentially the high level. Um, um, way of how it how it works. Well, I, I, I'm still a little confused. Maybe it's maybe I'm just trying to make it too simple. If we're the fiscal agent, we're the fiscal agent. It's not it's not going to cost us anything. Why is the 186 thousand in the MOU? Cindy, um, please move forward and make a comment. I yes, also have the same question, so um, thank you very much. Um, so as Chris mentioned, the, the funding comes through FDOT. The $96,000 is part of a grant that was executed last year, um, and DOT cannot transfer that money um, outside of our agency. Um, so we, we control that $96,000. They have subsequently found another $90,000 that they will channel through us as well, um, whereby we will pay the downtown partnership and we will then submit that invoice to DOT for reimbursement. And the 50% that needs to be matched, um, so again, the $186,000 that would have to come from uh, the CRAs, would be paid directly to the downtown partnership as a demonstration of that match. So we, we are not paying them any more than the $186,000 that we will then be reimbursed to um, through FDOT. Um, but it, it, the way in which FDOT works, it requires a conduit, and we're it. Okay. Is that a question? I think so. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner Olberman. You are recognized. <coughs> Thank you, Chair. I uh, do see that we will be going. We have those those ninety six thousand that's set aside, but I also recognize that um, in previous presentations, if I'm not mistaken, an extension of this after um, after September thirty in order to qualify for FDOT funds would have to be a, um, a, fixed, a fixed route alternative. So this on-demand really will be preserved through September 30, but the service may change after that date. Is that, is that correct? Uh, yes, Commissioner, and that's part of what we are developing in the RFP, um, and we are why we are working so closely with DOT and the city and, and SPP downtown so that we can find a solution that um, um, allows us to leverage that funding from DOT in the future. Um, and um, I, I, again, I, we would like to bring that back to you um, um, at a point in time when, when we're prepared to give you a complete, a completed um, um, a completed project proposal, if, if that's what's necessary. Um, I, I think we want to be careful about how much we put out there right now, being that it's a, we're going to put this out publicly as an RFP. Thank you. This is Dave Mechanic. I'd like to be recognized. Dave Mechanic, you're recognized. Oh, yes, thank you. Um, I, I think this request, I think the staff has made clear that part is not coming up with any additional money. I believe the local match is coming from the city of Tampa, 
Yes, which I don't think was mentioned before. Uh, I don't know that for a fact, but I heard that. Um, and so all we're doing essentially is preserving the status quo until the RFP can be issued and Hart determines what would be an appropriate alternative with on the assumption, and I'm, I'm asking Chris this, on the assumption that the response to the RFP and the decision would be made before September 30th, if at all possible. Is that right? Uh, yes, sir. Absolutely. We are, you know, our goal is, is for there to be no gap in service. Okay. Well, with that, I'll make a motion to recommend this item to the full board. Thank I'll you. I'll second that, that back to Commissioner Overman. Thank you. The motion was made by Commissioner Fischler and second by Commissioner Olberman. Will you take a vote, please, Danielle? Thank you, Chair Williams. The motion is to approve committee action item 4C. It was made by Councilman Schistler and approved, or I'm, I'm sorry, and seconded by um, Commissioner Overman, please say yay or nay after your name is called. Director Melanie Williams. Yay. Director David Mechanic. Yes. Commissioner Pat Kemp. Yes. Director Richard McLean. Commissioner Kimberly Overman. Yes. Councilmember Gil Schistler? Yes. The motion passes with a vote of five to zero. Um, also, I wanted to note for the um, committee and particularly the chair that there is, a, there is less than 15 minutes left in this meeting before the Strategic Planning and External Relations Committee is scheduled to uh, begin. And you guys currently still have three presentations, the voice of the customer, um, the monthly safety and security update and COVID-19 response presentations. I wanted to ask the committee if you would want to continue with all three of those or maybe postpone and, and we can start the, the second committee later or we can uh, postpone um, any of the presentations. The presentation for voice of the customer is a survey, right? Yes. Okay, is that a safety survey? It is just the overall satis. From my understanding, it's the overall satisfaction of our of our bus service. Okay, um, I, I guess I'll be right line on Mr. Bracken. He's going to present that one, and then we also have a second one from Mr. Malloy. Actually, the second and third are from Mr. Malloy, and I, I think with what what we have before us at this time that we are definitely concerned about the safety and the security as well as COVID-19. So I would recommend we, we, I recommend we go directly to B and C and, um, and the whole five, um, excuse me, A uh, for another time. I do thank know you, Commissioner Kemp Chairman. raised her hand. Uh, thank you. I was mm -hmm. just going to say the same thing. I mean, we shouldn't be doing voice of the customer. It's uh, too important. All the, uh, the COVID-19 and, and uh, what's going on with that, our safety. Thank you. Julia, do we need a motion for that or is it just, does it just go on the record? Uh, well, if we're gonna continue this to a specific meeting that we need a motion, if we're just gonna really um, put them on another agenda, then we uh, just note it for the record. This is Commissioner Overman. I move that we move the, uh, the Presentation of Voice of a Customer 5A to the next meeting. The handout was actually passed out to the board members for review, but we can address the actual details and any questions at the next committee meeting. This is Gil Schuster, sorry, second. Thank you. Will you take a vote, please, Danielle? Yes, ma'am. So the motion was made by Commissioner Overman and seconded by Councilmember Schistler to move item 5A to the next committee meeting. 
Please say yay or nay after your name is called. Director Melanie Williams? Yay. Director David Mechanic? Yes. Commissioner Pat Kemp? Yes. Uh, Commissioner Kimberly Overman? Yes. Councilmember Gil Schistler? Yes. And I forgot to announce uh, last time I spoke that um, Committee Member McLean had to um, get off the call at about 1010. So we did note that for the minutes, and that's why he is not voting. This motion carry or it passes five to zero. Thank you. Colin, that means that um, your presentation for the monthly safety and security update. Uh, yes, this is uh, this is Colin. I am online. Okay. Uh, um, uh, if you could open up with the first slide, um, this presentation will be the monthly safety and security update. What I will be sharing and speaking about is an analysis of the February accidents. I'm also sharing with you the February verbal and physical altercation, the March updates, and action items and any questions that you may have. Uh, next slide. So in looking at February, one of the things that kind of pulls out from February is that we are starting to see a little bit of a decline in some of the accident types that I've shared with this committee previously. So one of the key things I would point out is on the bus side, is that between January and February, we actually saw a decrease in specific fixed objects mirror collisions. Um, I point that out because that traditionally has been one of the higher type of events that we see. Um, one of the things that I would attribute that to is we did roll out a number of those mitigation things that we have talked about, such as targeted refresher training, our quarterly safety training, deeper analysis in the type of the accidents, and we've been using that information to target different activities that we do to make our system safer. Um, on the para side, there hasn't been much of a change um, in, the, in the overall type of accidents that we've received. Um, streetcar, we're trending um, very similar as well. The type of events we saw on the streetcar side um, were very low dollar value in terms of um, uh, uh, the collisions that, that we did see during that, that period of time. Um, overall in February, the largest type of event that we saw um, was a third party vehicle striking heart. Um, and so those are things that moving forward we're going to look at is um, things that we can do on our non-preventable type of accidents of, of how we enhance the safety. Um, next slide. I um, also wanted to, you know, as we talked about with this committee, is share with you guys on a regular basis the physical and verbal altercations that we see so that you guys are, so that the board is directly informed. In the month of February, we had no physical altercations. Uh, we did have 12 trespasses. Um, breaking down those verbal altercations, we had 10 within the month of February. Six of those on the bus side did involve what we classify as threatening language, and four of those involved offensive language or behavior. Um, we have been looking at those events by mode as well, and I can share that in February there were no events um, in terms of verbal altercations or physical altercations as it relates to our paratransit um, service. Next slide. Um, one of the things is that we will have a deeper breakdown for you um, of the March information. One of the things is we were preparing for this presentation to get it to the board is with COVID-19, putting some of those metrics based on the changes in our service, um, as well as the information from the, um, the pandemic and the interaction we've been doing with the EOC and Department of Public Health. We'd like to give you a fuller picture of what's occurring in March, and we'll have that information for you in um, at our next committee meeting. The one thing I will say is that we, we did look just to make sure that there was no you know, spike in verbal or physical altercations. We did not see any of that in the month of March. Um, in fact, if you were to look at our trespasses, we've seen a 50% decrease in the number of trespasses that we had to issue in the month of March. So there was no specific, I would say, long-term trend change in terms of the, the security events. 
but the next committee, we want to make sure that we give you that full information. Uh, next slide. Just to show you, this, this picture um, is our safety day of action in February. This just represents just um, actions that we've done to help mitigate of committing that we talked about of being out in the streets, riding the routes, getting operators input, recognizing our maintenance and um, bus and van operators. So February 28th was that safety day of action. This slide just shows all the work that the operations team, the safety team, the maintenance training, human resources of us being more visible out on the street, on the routes, speaking with our employees about safety and security. Um, next slide. So some action items just to share with you is uh, we did, um, in terms of our commitment to security, work with Tampa PD and the Heart Control Center on specific training with our control center about how they respond to these calls and looking at best practices. So we actually brought in dispatchers from the Tampa Police Department to come in and provide training to our control center Supervisor. So uh, that was a very good program of how they communicate, how they talk about, how we prioritize hard events if we do come across either physical or verbal. So we're being proactive on that. Um, again, we reviewed the routes that we see some of the highest safety events, such as the 1 or the 400. Um, we've been looking at our training program. Uh, we are also um, updating our hurricane plan right now. In May, we'll give you a further presentation on that. Um, the targeted refresher training, which we've seen results, which is what we um, show some of this decrease on, that'll continue, as well as our performance analysis meeting will be continue moving forward and keeping this committee uh, updated on. Next slide. Okay, so um, with that, I, I with, for the sake of time, I'd love to go just straight into COVID, if that, if that works. Yes, please do. Okay. Um, so, uh, in terms of this slide, when I start this slide off, I just want to make sure that I um, publicly state how honored I am to be part of the organization, the work that our employees have done during this time from our bus operators, from our maintenance employees, to our admin employees um, who have really stepped up and um, shown great perseverance and working with this community to make sure that we are safe but also keep service to those individuals in our community that need it. So as I start this presentation, I want to provide with you the initial actions we've taken since March, talking more in depth about the coordination this organization has been doing through this period, how that has affected our service, uh, but most importantly, putting our riders to safety, sharing specifically what we've done to make sure that we're uh, guaranteeing riders' safety and our employees' safety um, throughout this entire process. So if we could go to the next slide. So our initial actions, from the very beginning, HART has um, worked with the Hillsborough County Department of Public Health and the EOC as soon as this information um, was provided within the state, even starting in March 2nd, we began that coordination. One of the first things we did is that not only did we review HART's existing pandemic plan from 2009, we updated it specifically with the Department of Public Health. So we updated the entire pandemic plan that we had that looked at things such as how we respond, how we communicate, making sure that we're keeping all the buses disinfected, is that we um, updated that entire plan. And we actually shared that plan with a number of agencies that did not have anything. And it was recognized as a best practice from both our coordination with the Hillsborough County Department of Public Health and the EOC. Um, through that coordination, we've been kind of following the lead of Hillsborough County government that as they've made movements and consultations such as canceling events and meetings, HART has followed that. Um, we really tried to move a, um, a very coordinated um, service level that spoke with first looking at our streetcar of how we could reduce service um, of any events on there, um, utilizing our pandemic plan um, on March 15th. Um, our interim CEO, Carolyn House Stewart, did a declaration of emergency and, noti and noticed the implementation of the pandemic plan that was required through the SOP. Um, we also canceled all public meetings um, and limited our public and private um, gatherings as well. So again, our initial actions from the very beginning, we've been 
addressing this issue head on, talking about how it works, um, talking about the things that we need to put in place for, one, making sure that we are keeping our employees safe as well as our passengers safe as we serve this community. Um, next slide. So internally, how have we done that? Heart through the SOP, we have an internal emergency response team that has been meeting daily on this topic. One of the things that you know, is shared both from the county level and the Hillsborough County Office of Emergency Management is how fluid this situation is and how information has changed and how this has changed. Due to that, the Heart Emergency Response Team has been meeting daily to make those situations, um, uh, that situational awareness. Um, externally, I also want to share with this committee is that Heart meets daily with the Hillsborough County Department of Public Health and the Office of Emergency Management. So all of our decision making is based on consultation with the Department of Public Health locally with our contacts. So we follow those CDC guidelines and the recommendations that both the EOC and the County Department of Health provides us. We have given over you know, updates to FTA about what our service levels have been, of what actions. Um, just through you know, the month of March, we have over four press releases since March 15th. Um, as the Hillsborough County School Board was providing grab-and-go food locations, Hart was providing free rides. Um, we never stepped back from our commitment to this community, and one of that commitments is making sure that we provide free rides and transportation to individuals that, um, yeah, over 1,000 rides were provided in the, in the month of April through this program. Of, um, so we're very excited and happy that we were able to help those students and those families that needed to utilize the grab-and-go program. Um, because of our, our consultation with the Hillsborough County Department of Public Health and the EOC, we were able to receive just through um, the month of March over 4,000 surgical masks that we were able to get out to our frontline employees. Recently, we received over 2,500 additional masks. So. Um, as we've been going through this process, we are um, continually providing requests to the Office of Emergency Management um, and the Department of Public Health to make sure we can get as much PPE to our employees as practically as possible. Um, we are, again, this comes into those daily communications with those agencies is that we are asking as they receive PPE that those can make sure that that PPE can get to the frontline employees. Um, you know, it's been important we felt that we communicate to our employees and be transparent. Just to give you some numbers, we have over 225 individual yet unified messages, both English and Spanish and bilingual, co communicating what we've done. And the way we were able to do that is because that emergency response team is meeting daily. So as decisions are being made based on consultation with those outside agencies, we're pushing it out as soon as practical to our employees and to the public. Um, next slide. Uh, I'm now going to pass it over to operations, and they can talk a bit more in depth about um, the service plans. So effective um, April 1st, we went with a temporarily reduced Sunday schedule for our um, level of service on the street for local routes, and we did continue to provide the express routes, which serve many of our key destinations including MacDill Air Force Base, downtown Tampa, the airport, and such. Um, uh, my name is Ruthie Reyes-Burkard for um, Deputy Chief of Transportation. Um, we continue to provide this service through this week. Um, this morning you would have seen a notification going out that based on ridership and the attendance of our operators in terms of absenteeism that is continually growing as operators are managing their health situations, quarantine and or child care and or FMLA or regular ill, we're noting that we have fewer operators to operate even this level of service, which is level four of the pandemic plan and does take us to a 50% reduction in service. Um, on effective Wednesday this week, we will be removing temporarily a few of the express routes, which include the 20, 24, 25, and 60X. Um, those will cease to operate temporarily. We will continue to run the 360LX, which serves the Brandon area 
to downtown and then to McDill Air Force Base, affording those individuals that were still riding an opportunity to reach those destinations. And we will run the north end segment of the 275LX, getting those between the Wiregrass Park and Ride and the University Area Transportation Center a opportunity to continue to ride and make connections into the system there. Local buses from there can still get you from UATC to downtown into the airport, though there is very minimal transactions happening at the airport. Um, we continue to monitor the ridership. We continue to monitor the activities out on the road. We continue to monitor the absences and attendance of our employees, and we'll be continually looking to update this system, whether it's reintroducing service as things improve and or a level of another reduction if needed. Thank you, Colin. Okay. Thank you, Ruthie. Next slide. So as we've talked about operations, I also want to, it's important that we share with you kind of rider safety, is that the day we began reviewing our pandemic plan, we were immediately addressing our rider safety with daily disinfection of the entire fleet. Um, in the month of March, just to give you some numbers, we have disinfected 2,970 times on the bus. We have disinfected over 1,115 uh, times on the bus equating to over 527 hours have been focused, dedicated to making sure that we are disinfecting um, the buses and our cleaning regime. We're using an EPA registered disinfectant and we are hitting our facilities in the morning, afternoon, and evening. So we have put a high priority of making sure that we are disinfecting those areas as, as quickly as possible and as often as possible. If we come into a unique situation where a vehicle has to be quarantined, we have actually have a certified outside vendor that can come in and do a deeper kind of biohazard quarantine sanitization of that entire bus. We have tested the validity of that system, and we have also ensured that they are available um, for emergency calls as needed. So again, um, we have made a priority of disinfecting our common services, our buses where the riders come into contact with, and we even have lined up outside specialists in case we need to utilize those services. Um, next slide. Continue on rider safety of those were the actions we did about disinfecting, but communicating to the public was so critical, and we wanted to have a full enterprise type of approach of we were using social media channels, you know, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram since March 4th, communicating to the public what we've been doing. We've had on-hold messages on our customer service area. We've done blog posts. We've done audio announcements on the bus. We've used our One Bus Away application as well as our Internet homepage. And we've sent out mailings specifically to our Heart Plus customers based on their unique needs. You know, we've done posters throughout our public facilities and internal facilities. We've given guidance to our customer service lines for phone calls. We've had employee um, signatures go out. We've had signage again at our transit centers. You know, we've looked at staggered seating. We've, we've really made a concerted push of communicating to the public all the actions that HART is doing, and we're going to continue to do that moving forward as the situation changes. Um, next slide. Hey, Colin, it's, it's Director Williams. Uh, yes. If you could just wrap up, wrap up in a couple of minutes. We're already into the next committee time, meeting time, so if we could wrap up as quickly as possible, please. Okay. Um, really quickly, just on employee safety, um, on the slide you can see we've done a whole series of emails so like I talked about with the riders, with the employees, we've really did a concerted effort of making sure we're uh, communicating to the employees. 19 emails, 12 television monitors. Um, uh, so um, next slide. Um, I just want to highlight just real quickly the great job our employees are doing. We have um, unveiled a campaign saying I am essential because of the critical work they're doing. Um, the gentleman here, Ronnie Coleman, actually helped put together kits for our employees. We've had um, members of operations that have reached out to uh, microbrews that have provided sanitization for our employees. Um, just on Friday, members of the legal and risk team were putting together specific kits for bus operators. So people are really stepping up. Um, we've put in work from home policies and pushed out PPE as quickly as possible. 
Um, one of the things that's been truly a, a very great mitigation is actually the safety shields on our buses. Those act as a barrier to help protect our employees even more. Um, next slide. Um, in our facilities, we've been enforcing spacing and using the social distancing. Um, we also worked with the union to make sure that we could put equitable work assignments as much as possible of ensuring operators get 40 hours of paid time. That was in agreement with the ATU. Um, ATU leadership has been a great partner in this, and um, we we're thankful for all the work that they've done of helping us maintain service. Next slide. And, and, and finally, just to let you know, we've been also staying on track of the, you know, the federal and employee and employment um, labor laws, and we have made sure to communicate to our employees um, all those actions, and we'll continue to update as we receive that information. Um, so uh, that would close my presentation at this point, um, uh, Director Williams. Uh, thank you, Mr. Malloy. You, um, as always, provide such detailed information regarding the safety of our employees and the safety of our community and, and how we help one another to make sure that the people who need it are going to get it. Uh, keeping in, 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 in time, it's in consideration that time is of essence. Does anyone have any questions at this time? I do. This is Commissioner Kemp. Commissioner Kemp, you're right, good night. Thank you. I think that this is the most important thing facing us, um, how, how we deal with this. And I want to, I, I know it's been a hard year for um, the, our director of safety. Uh, and this is new uncharted territory that we're going into and we're kind of taken um, by surprise. Um, I'm sure or not sure that um, other board members know that there's been um, some um, criticism of how we're handling it in the uh, media or some stories about it and, and by our own employees in some way. So I, um, and I, I don't, it is extremely difficult. It's been done, you know, uh, I think it's, it's very, very hard to account for what's happened. Uh, we've had to cut back the schedule. And then with cutting back the schedule, we have actually our, our buses are, have been uh, way more full. We were actually, I saw a Canadian article which said that Tampa lost fewer riders than almost any transit agency in North America, and I'm thinking that that's because our, our um, what we do is so limited and so necessary. So uh, in terms of that, I know that we have been um, now um, marking seats so that people couldn't sit on them to limit the number of people that are on a bus. I know that um, we have also, for instance, routes like Florida Avenue that were once every 15 minutes for now every hour. So I'm just, I'm, um, I'm, I think it's really important for us to be thinking about perhaps some um, routes like that, restoring at least half hourly service because um, the, you know, people are either left behind at the stops or uh, this, we also saw after the seats were marked, some took pictures of all the seats being full. And when we have that, we're not um, achieving social distancing. So I wondered if uh, Mr. Malloy could speak to some of those concerns. Okay. Commissioner Kemp, this is Carolyn Stewart. Uh, correction, the Florida Avenue route is every 30 minutes. Uh, it is not okay, every hour. Thank you. And also, we're, and we're also working on trying to get it down to every 15 minutes. And we do have plug buses that do come in. Uh, and the so that's all I can tell you is that we have the plug buses in place now in those places where we didn't have them before. And Florida Avenue has always been every 30 minutes under the Sunday schedule. And we're now trying to work toward getting it every uh, 15 minutes like it used to be. And Great. So that's excellent. All I can say is that we just have to also emphasize personal responsibility among the public to support us in this effort with social distancing and not sitting in the seats. And once we see that the buses are getting full, we do have the to have the plug buses in place. And so that's the only re response we have for today. All right. Okay, Thank you so was, much. That, um, I appreciated hearing that um, because I think it's really important for our board to understand and for the public to understand um, this process and what's being done and how we can deal with it. Because there, 
they're, um, you know, hearing uh, different kinds of information. So I think it's really important to share our challenges and how we're moving forward on this. Thank you. Danielle? Commissioner Oberman, you are recognized. Thank you, Chair. Um, one, I want to say thank you to all of uh, the HARP employees, operators, mechanics, everyone. Um, you're first responders, in my opinion, and you're out there um, bravely doing what you're doing. And I think everyone needs to, to be very appreciative of those that are able to show up at work. Um, the emergency policy group last week made a strong recommendation that anyone um, that is, you know, out and about in public should be wearing a face covering. And I heard earlier that we are making PPE available. I assume that's surgical masks and, and maybe shields, but maybe not that extent. But either way, all riders and all drivers and all workers that are in come in contact with each other probably should have um, face coverings. And so if that is something that's been implemented not only among the employees at, at heart across the board, um, maybe signage to recommend that face covering is recommended by the emergency policy group so that our riders also recognize that it's okay to, you know, to wear a bandana with a coffee filter or whatever they use to be able to protect themselves. Um, I had questions earlier regarding some of the, the safety um, report in February, but I'll pass that for later on down the road. But we do have and did see earlier in uh, the week that it came out in the news that there is a an employee that actually has been identified as positive for COVID-19. Um, um, does someone have the information on how many employees are in quarantine or self-isolation? We recognize that there are going to be those that are on leave for child and elder care, but it would be helpful uh, to have a good understanding of the level of, of potential exposure among our employee groups so that we can maintain service on a reliable basis. Commissioner Overman, this is um, Colin Malloy, Director of Safety. Um, to answer your first question, we are strongly supporting. We've been recommending the face coverings in line with the CDC guidance and the guidance we've gotten from, from FTA on that. So we've been strongly encouraging. That's why we've had such a great push with the EOC of getting those surgical masks, but we have also recommended employees to use any type of face covering as we obtain additional PPE. We have also um, ordered cloth masks um, for additional to provide um, over 1,000 cloth masks to provide to our, um, our employees as well. So we've had the strongest recommendation from the beginning of this of, in support of that um, face covering uh, recommendation. Um, in regards to the, um, the employee you mentioned, uh, we can get that information to you um, Excuse me, Ms. this is uh, Carolyn Stewart. I receive daily reports on absenteeism across the agency, and so for today I can tell you that we have a total of 45 bus operators who are out because of provider-ordered or um, self-quarantine, uh, eight van operators, one streetcar, and one maintenance. We do have uh, 20 employees who've been cleared to return to work, uh, nine van, two streetcar, seven maintenance. You're correct. We only have one employee who's tested positive for COVID, and we have other employees who are out uh, for other reasons such as illness, FMLA, and we do have a total of um, nine bus operators and three maintenance employees who are out today because they're taking advantage, and I don't mean advantage in a uh, not a positive way, but are availing themselves for the um, fam child care provision of the new act. And then we have a total of uh, six employees who are already out under uh, FMLA. And employees Thank you very much. For, right. And employees who are out for quarantine on doctor's orders, it may not mean that they have any symptoms. It may mean that they have someone in the household that they're taking care of or because they have underlying health conditions which require them to be out so that they're not exposed. Thank you. Thank you. Um, You're welcome. 
Um, at this time, um, are there any other, is there any new business, old business that we have not discussed at this point time? I have another question. This is Commissioner Kemp. Um, um, Ms. Lee, um, I'm sorry, Ms. Uh, Stewart. So, so 45 um, bus drivers are out at this time. How many bus drivers do we have? We have a total of 360 empl employees who are qualified to drive the vans and the um, and the buses. Okay, and they can um, drive either one of those. No, no, only the ones who have the CDL can drive the buses. Okay, okay. Um, I was just curious about what that number seemed was like in relationship to our, our total employee pool. So I, I just I would suggest based on the questions and, and the fact that we had to speak to those live just moments ago, if you could um, respond to the board and let us know the the status of our employees and yeah. and where they are in the process. We will certainly do that. Thank you. Uh, I am going to uh, ask one more time: new business, old business. If not, um, if not hearing any, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you.